Welcome to another special bonus episode of the Paul Ryder Tapes. This one features one of our most requested guests. You absolutely loved him in the main series, so we're giving you his extended interview. It's an old friend of mine who I've known since the early 90s. He parted in the Manchester rave scene and he also made an appearance in the Netflix documentary We The People and went out of his way to support Chico when he was sick. He's also the owner of Tough Gong Studios in Warrington where the Mondays rehearsed when they reformed in 2012 and he's currently working with Gaz Whelan on his solo project, Yogi G and the Family Tree. He's the inimitable ball of effervescent energy. That is the mighty Latch. Right, now I'll take the glasses off now because you're further away. I didn't know you had a recording studio there. I thought it was taking the piss. I didn't know it was a recording studio. I thought it was a rehearsal studio. We've got rehearsal rooms downstairs. It's a fucking massive recording studio up here. I did not know that. I've been here 23 years. I did not know that, that you had a recording studio. Yeah, hang on. Let me show you around. There we go. Hang on. Let's get the full view. Nice. Brilliant. Oh shit! What have I done? I feel. <laughs> did did the Mondays did the Mondays ever didn't ever do any recording there? Did they? Not as the Mondays, no. no. Okay, but but you've had you've had Rowetta there, haven't you? Recording stuff. Well, recording stuff. so I was producing a band called. They were called China White. Oh, okay, I remember them. Who then became the Winachi Tribe? Right. Yeah, I remember them. And Row featured on a track with them. Right. And that's how I met Ro. Right. And then, then she started coming to me going, I want to come. And she, she gets asked to do a lot of vocal stuff, doesn't she? Yeah. So I was recording a lot of her vocals for years. Uh, so I think that's how, when the Mondays were reforming, I think that's how my name got thrown in the hat. Right, right, right. Because right. Uh, they were specifically looking for something not in Manchester. Right, right. Do you for know why, obvious reasons. And you know why that was, yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that my name got thrown in the art and then I think it might have been Gaz that contacted me. Yeah. I can't remember, but we, we spoke, they nipped down and then went, yeah, cool, right. and booked in here for six weeks. And then, obviously, as a, as a result of that, Paul came up to me one day and went, you know my wife. And I'm like, do I? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I went, what's her name? He went, Anne Smith. No way, like I've known Angela for years, so yeah, and then you know, obviously, Gaz as well. Well, we're working on Gaz's album at the minute. Oh, are you? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that. well, you, then, then something else you don't know is uh, it's probably the last thing Paul's ever recorded. Oh, really? Yeah, one of the tracks has got Paul playing bass on it, and it's probably the last thing he's recorded. Wow, and that's there going you on, go, that's going on Gaz's album. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's cool, isn't it? It That's is cool. cool. I'm trying to bring together all, all of the unreleased material, but even okay. any unreleased bass lines that haven't been used in anything, and then right. put something together. Right. To well, sp- speak to Gaz. Yeah. Because, like I say, there's there's definitely one song, because it was what the stems get sent to me from all over, you know, all the, the various right. audio files. And when I'm sort of yeah. piecing it together and trying to build it, one of them said, Paul bass. And I was like, and so I said to Gaz, is this Paul? And he went, oh, it might be. I don't know. I'll find out. So he spoke to Dan who recorded it. And he went, oh, yeah, it's a, it is. I went, Do you realise it's probably the last thing he's recorded? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got that. And it is on one of the songs we're working on. How do you want to be referred to just as Latch? Or do you want your real name used? What? Not bothered, mate, Latch, yeah. What what are you? What, I don't even know your proper name. I'm like Sinbad the sailor. Lee Latchford, is it? What's your, what's no. your name? What is Lee it? Parker. Oh. So where did Latch come from then? It's just a nickname from school. Do you, do you really want to know? Picking locks. <laughs> school, you know, like just up to hijinks. Yeah. That's 
where it comes from, but that's that's a secret. That. All right, okay. Well, well. I used to say, at some point in my life, I used to go, my surname's Latchford, just for so I didn't have to explain that. Right. Oh, That's okay. where it comes from. So that's what, probably why I thought your last name was Latchford. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, well, you've probably been told that at some point. Right, so let's go, let's start with, when did yeah. you first... Can, do you remember the first time you ever met Paul? So basically, the band reformed in 2012. Um, they wanted a location outside of Manchester to rehearse in. Like I say, I think Rogue threw my name in the app. Some emails were exchanged, blah, blah, blah. We get the green light. Equipment starts arriving and the band are going to arrive on this day, if you know what I mean. So, So by the time everyone lands it's like all hands on deck i think we had a couple of techs here you know and it was just getting everyone set up and obviously you know what i mean you've been professional you're running a business it's just let, let, let's get these guys set up and, and give them what they need so there wasn't really any time to get to know anyone at that right. point so I, I couldn't say it was possibly even when paul said to me you know my wife yeah. that was possibly the first time i ever met paul yeah it was a, it was it was some time then you know what I mean like I'm sort of hovering around just to make sure everything's running smoothly and and they've got everything they need uh, you know and then obviously we've got the the sort of canteen out there so when they were taking breaks or whatnot you know I, I might say hello or have a chat but again part of it is you don't want to be you want to be there to help you know and be on hand to make sure everything seems smooth but you don't want to intrude either do you but but you know me I'm sort of relatively easy to get along with so yeah. you get chatting quite quite quickly but yeah possibly that could possibly have been the, the yeah. first ever piece of conversation we had yeah. you know my wife right which well, yeah. he's, he's always worrying when another bloke says that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, were you a mondays fan before any of this yes uh in the sense that yes i was off my face on drugs and was fully aware of the Happy Mondays. Can't say I was a huge fan, hmm. per se. I was a huge fan of all of the music of, of that time. You know, Mondays, Stone Roses, Charlotte, and Soup Dragons, whatever, Farm, whatever. I don't know whether you'd I realised this at the time or so, it's something you realise later on. With any sort of musical movement, let's call it, for want of a better term, the Manchester movement, there's always a couple of artists who sort of transcend it and are the epitome of it. And it, you've got to say the Stone Roses in the Mondays, haven't you? Right. Now, what I will say is when they first started rehearsing it, I was shocked at how good they were as a band. Because it you don't... Well, one, when you're off your box on, on drugs, you're not like kind of got appreciating the musicianship. But two, because it was so produced in a sort of dance style, you never really got a feel for what that was like as a live band. Right. But when you hear them in a room playing, you're like, holy, holy shit, these can play. You know what I mean? These are like a proper band. Yeah, yeah so that, that surprised me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But like I say, there's still, again, we all do that thing. There's, there's, there's moments throughout our life where a track is sparks a nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And for me step on mm -hmm. you know you hear step on and i'm back i'm back there do you know what i mean yeah. what are your memories of hearing step on in a club when you're off your box like do you remember a night particular particular night when you heard it or just take me back to those times uh, nowhere in particular it was <clears throat> probably my most vivid memories of of those times are would be two nightclubs and we went to a lot of different nightclubs, but two were sort of stapled in where we went to. And one was a little place in Witness called Stories um, that had three floors. And on the top floor was just that dance music. And it was it was full of smoke and everyone was just off the face. Um, and the other one was Mr. Smith's, which was huge. Um, I don't think at the time Smith's had the same sort of drug culture as some of the smaller clubs, but clearly there were a lot of people off the faces in there. Uh, me being one of them and again with my ex access to the dancers and and you know I knew the door staff and everything else so I was just roaming around on my face watching lasers and smoke 
loving it, you know what I mean? I mean, and again, there are several tunes from that era, including the Mondays, where you, you uh, I'm there. I'm like, oh, yes. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> So just tell me a bit more about those days. So what was like the, the routine for a night out? What what was the vibe like? Um, I, I used to have a friend who was a DJ who lived really in the town centre in Warrington uh, in a shared house. There was several people lived in the house. So what we used to do uh, was go round his house. We'd all sort of meet there because it was a five minute walk into town. So we'd all meet at his house, all take our respective drugs um, while he DJ'd until we all come up. And when we were all up and ready to rock and roll, it was, you know, cover yourself in aftershave. And back then, if you were going to club, you had to wear a shirt. <laughs> right. And tie, you know what I mean? And trousers and, and shoes uh, and head into town from there. And... Yeah. I mean, again, not not that this is particularly relevant. I was a, a massive fan of Speed when Ecstasy first came out, and one of our crowd was a, a dealer, and it, he'd be like, "Oh, you want to try these E's? They, they they sort of just come out, kind of thing." And oh, back then, I'm thinking he was like twenty five quid, which was like a week. That was like a weekend on the piss. That was a weekend's boozing money. So. We'd all go like, oh, yeah, yeah, So I'd have one. All, all the boys would have one. They'd all be off the boxes, and I'd be stone cold sober, nothing. Like, nothing. And I'm like, that was 20... That's me weekend money gone, and I'm nothing here. And, you know, I'd have enough a few beers. And then, so next week, I'd have some um, some whiz or whatever. And this this carried on for a bit. And occasionally, they'd, they'd talk you into, go on, try another one. You must have had a dud. Try another one. Try another one. Oh, all right, then, you try another one. And it didn't work. And this was for ages. And then you may or may not remember these E's coming out called Doves. No. no. Right. So you, were you, was you not into the whole drug culture thing? I wasn't in the country. I was in New York in 86. And then I was right, in the okay. country. So I wasn't part of the Manchester thing, really, no. Oh, right. Wow. Oh, I was living in right, London. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, these 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 E's came out called Dubs. And when I rocked up at my mates and knocked on the door, the lad who's the drug dealer answered the door. And he didn't look in a good way. Like, he'd had a couple of these things, and he was fucked, to, to put no too fine a point on it. And I looked at him, and he went, and he's like, you've got to try one of these new E's. You've got to try one of these new E's. They're amazing. I guarantee it'll work. I guarantee it'll work. I'm looking at him, Bragg me was fucking terrified. And I went, go on then, I'll have one. And I thought, I, I'll box clever here. I'll just take half. Because I thought, he that he looks that fucked, half should do it. And I'll save half for tomorrow or next week or whatever. So I bought this thing, took half a bit. We're all there, we're all, ooh, music, boom, boom, and did let's it go, work? down. Did it no, work? No, no. So we get into the club. Everyone's bopping around. I'm sat there, like going, "What is going on here?" And they, you know, they're all all the lads. It's again one of the beautiful things about that, the, particularly the early days of of the drug culture was it. It was a united thing. Everyone was like, "Oh, everyone wanted everyone else to enjoy themselves." So it's like, "Oh, yeah, are you, have you got anything yet? Are you are you up? Is it, is it great? You know, you're having a brilliant time and all this lot." And so they're all coming over. I, I, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? I'm like, nothing, nothing. So one of them says to me, how much have you had? I said, just half a tablet. He went, have the other half. Well, at that point, I've got nothing to lose, have I? Hi. So I took the other half of this thing. And I, I don't know how long later, 20 minutes later, I was not in a good way. Right, my fingers felt like sausages. <laughs> and it, you know when you're moving your hands, like every time my fingers brush past one another, they were like really <laughs> numb and weird and... You know, and I'm going, what is going on with my fingers here? And then I went, do you remember as a kid when you were out on a winter's day and you were freezing and you used to come in and stand next to the radiator and it uh -huh. burned, uh -huh. but it was sort of nice. I yeah. was like that all over. So I've got these sausage fingers, I'm on fire, and I'm thinking, what the fucking hell's going on here? And then I was like, I was going all week, I couldn't lift my arms. And, you know, it was like, I felt like I was melting like this right now and then another weird thing happens the paranoia kicks in so 
on, I'm quite a veiny person. Like I've got, you know, veins on the back of my hands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm looking at the back of my hands, and all the veins have gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at the back of my hands, going, "Oh my Jesus, where have my veins gone?" Like I don't, I don't feel good here. And my mate who's with me, who's drunk, can see him struggling a bit, and he leans over and he says, uh, are "You all right, mate? Are you all right?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah, I'm cool, cool." And he went, "What's up?" And I thought, all right, don't don't be paranoid, like." So I went, can you see any veins in the back of my hands there? Thinking he'd go, yeah. And then I'd go, brilliant. That's what I wanted, veins in the back of my hands. And I went, can you see any veins in the back of my hands there? And he went, no, you're not right, mate. There's nothing there. I was like, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> so then the, the, the lad who, who sold it me comes over and he's like, you're all right. I was like, mate, I, fucking, uh, I can't walk. I can't move or anything. He went, come on. We're going, we're going for a walk around, we'll get some fresh air. I was like a zombie walking through that nightclub. I, I vividly remember walking up the stairs. There must have been a six foot seven bodybuilder in front of me. Who's, I just literally walked into his chest like that. And I looked up like this at him. You know, and he must have been looking at me thinking, I'm going to knock you out or whatever. And it clearly he looked into my eyes and just went. And he just stepped to one side and I just carried on walking in a straight line. Went outside, got some fresh air. Gathered myself again and was all right after that. But that was the first time an E worked on me. And did you have a nice time after that? Oh, yeah, it was great yeah. after that, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, my drug of choice was, was speed, amphetamines. I fucking loved that drug, which was poor man's cocaine, basically. Yeah. Because cocaine was too expensive then for the right. likes of us pongos, working-class lads who had a minimum wage job, you know what I mean? Yeah. So then did you switch to E's after that? Occasionally, yeah, yeah, mixed and matched. I mean, there was a point in time, Angela, where I'd, if anyone give you anything, you'd have took it. Because it was, what I mean is, it wasn't, again, you, you're young, you're not, you know, you're not thinking, oh, someone could slip me. Bro, it no, didn't exist then, or, you know what I mean? You're not thinking date rape or poison or anything else. Like I say, that whole period of time was, was sort of beautiful. It, it's like any movement. It's, its intentions when it starts off are very pure, aren't they? And it's a sort of good uniting thing and it brings people together. It, it then becomes somehow, I don't know, infiltrated and devalued and abused and so but but to start with it's a, every movement I think is like that to yeah. start with. You know, yeah. most of these things start with the greatest of intentions and it's beautiful yeah. and it's lovely. Yeah. You know, and everyone's having a fabulous time and that's how I remember it. You know, by the time it all started to go wrong, I, I remember going, we went to the Hacienda a few times. You know, a mate of mine, in, another lad in Warrington was like, oh, I've been going to this club in Manchester, you should come, it's great. Luckily, we got there a couple of times before that all started to go wrong. Right. But then it all starts to go wrong and you just like... Right. Yeah. That, I mean. Do you remember the Mondays on the dance floor being a real part of that rave scene? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I could yeah. probably, you know, if I sat and thought about it, I could God, probably give you a playlist, but the Mondays would definitely be on that playlist. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, like I say, again, bear in mind I'm in music, so I always look at things in, in the musical sense of transition. So you've got the early early dance music stuff which was the sort of simple 808 drums and the chicago house stuff and stuff like that through through the late 80s early 90s and then as the 90s progressed we started to get and again it's a sort of natural progression it's like that that thing you know people go what white people can't make rap music right if you've grown up listening to rap music of course you can make rap music because you're you you are a product of your influences right. so by say the late 90s, all the young lads who had been listening to dance music but were playing analogue instruments were going, well, let's blend that together. Right. And I think that's what the Mondays did. I think that's what the Soup Dragons did. I think that's what the Stone Roses did. Those bands were, the, were that blend. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then coming out of the other side of that, came your Britpop thing they sort of maybe rebelled against the dance music to become more indie guitar band stuff but, but that period of time that transition was was young lads 
with real instruments trying to emulate dance music, if you will. Right. And, and Stone Roses and the Mondays, isn't it? That's yeah. that's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's probably a whole gamut of other bands. Well, there are, but but yeah. it's like I say, every every sort of if I said to you now, <clears throat> punk music, chances are you're going to say the Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm. You might say the Clash. You know, there's a couple of others, but there's there's always one or two standouts who transcend yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And again, over the passage of time, we we also get to appreciate the fact that it it was actually great because it still works now. You know, like I, I listen to some of the punk records I used to listen to now, and they're appalling. Mm. But you, you, I would probably have a Sex Pistols song played at my funeral. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. Because it's such an important thing for me. The Pistols, ironically, are probably the reason I got into making music and, and oh, doing really? this. Really? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, uh, the whole ethos of punk was that, that you don't have to be some middle-class art student to make music any dickhead can make music or create art. It does, I'm not necessarily mean it's going to be good, but this punk encourages to have a go. I, yeah. You know, and I suspect the Mondays probably did that for a whole generation of people. Like I say, the, there are these standouts in every little, I don't know, 10, 20 years, there's, there's a new music movement, you know, and there's always a couple of standouts. The Mondays are going to be, they're, they're, they're already on, they're written down in the history books. Aren't they? Yeah. They're yeah. already there now, and like I say, the beautiful thing is, even now, I can listen to many of their songs and go, "That's still a great song." Mm. A great mm. songs, a great songs, a great song. Yeah, yeah. And it's weird because it shouldn't work. No, <laughs> it shouldn't work. Yeah, but it does. But that's art, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So tell me a bit more about when they came in to the. The studio you did you hang out with them much like do you have you got any memories particularly yeah at that time well i already knew ro um you know i sort of you you, you know you get introduced so you you sort of know who everybody is um and like i say i was on hand really just just not involved with what they were doing but just on hand to lend any bit of technical advice or just just run things through they're in my building they're my guests and they're paying me money to be here I want everything to go smoothly, right? Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm nearby, but not necessarily yeah. in their faces. So of course, like yeah. I say, if they're having a tea break or yeah. whatever, um, you know, you get chatting, and like I say, they're all all really nice guys. But I gravitated towards Paul and Gaz. They, yeah. they, I think we're 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 of a similar age. I think we grew up at the same period of time. We've got similar experiences. I think we just hit it off. We're very similar yeah. in a lot of ways i feel yeah um so so we just hit it off big time yeah you know what i mean and paul's a smoker i'm a smoker so there's that because we're social pariahs aren't we you know what i mean i think he's the only one that smokes in the band now and mark doesn't smoke gaz doesn't smoke i think yeah. Ro would quit yeah. so again we, we were smoking buddies yeah me and paul i mean that man likes a bag he did didn't he <laughs> He and did. a kind of Red Bull. I know. <laughs> a crazy... Yeah, why do you not have a sponsorship deal? I know. He really should have done. He should have yeah. done. It. Spending a fortune on them. Me and Gaz, we do talk about him when we're together occasionally. And that was one of the... Not long after Paul died and we were talking about it, that was one of the things we were saying. It was like, fucking hell, the amount of cigarettes and Red Bull. That, how he lived this long, I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know. So were they like you expected when when you heard they were going to be coming in? Did you have like a preconceived notion about what they might be like? Yeah, of course, of course. I still still thought they were drug taking lunatics like they were back in the day. But of course, I was then, and I'm not now. So why why would I expect them to still be the same? I don't know. We're all a bit more mature now, aren't we? It's not. Yeah. It's not to say there's not an inner lunatic. Right. But you temper it a bit more these days, don't you? Or you pick your moments. So, yeah, I was expecting a lot of drug fuel lunatics smashing the place up and got all kinds of shenanigans. And simply that was not the case. They were professionals <laughs> who were there to do a job, who matured a bit as well, as has myself, hopefully. Yeah. And did you go in the room and listen to them play? You, you mentioned before that. Occasionally, but you, you didn't need to. I could, I could quite easily hear them from the cafe area. Right. Uh, my dad, my dad, come one time, 
uh, just just happened to call in. I think they were on a dinner break. My dad was brilliant. And, uh, it means- One of them fellas talked to anyone. So <clears throat> they were having a dinner break. Gaz and, and Paul were sat in one of the diner booths just eating. Gaz was probably eating something like hummus. <laughs> and Paul would have been eating a pie, probably, yeah. Yeah. whilst smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Again, that I could never understand. Eating and smoking at the same time. It, again, I was like, how do you do that? And he was like, oh, I fucking love it. I was like, I can't do that. I can't eat and smoke at the same time. One after the other, yeah. So anyway, my, my dad called him this day. And he must have said hello to him and he said hello back. So to me, dad, that's an invitation to sit down and chat. So he, he ended up sitting and chatting to Gaz and Paul for about, probably about an hour. <laughs> Honestly, and God knows what they were chatting about. And then um, they said, oh, we, we've got to go now. We're rehearsing. We're going, we're going back in there. And he went, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then uh, my dad comes over and went, oh, they were, they were some that They were nice lads. What do they do? I said, oh, they're in a band in there. He said, oh, what what they call that? I said, the Happy Mondays. He'd never heard of them, obviously. And he was like, oh, right. And then he he mentioned Paul. He went, he's got a lived-in face on him. (laughs) (laughs) First Monday morning, he's in work, telling all the lads, oh, you'll never guess who I was knocking around with the other day. The Happy Mondays didn't have a clue who they were. All the younger lads, no, you weren't. And he was like, yeah, I was chatting with him. We had a drink together and whatnot. No, that was my dad for you. But yeah, and then they, both of them later on was like, who's that fella? So no, it's my dad. He was like, oh, he was lovely, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to any Monday's gigs back in the day? <laughs> Again, Angela, my, my memories of that time are uh, somewhat um, eroded. Okay. Huh. It may well have played at the Hacienda if I, when I was there. Right. But I don't... Not weirdly, enough. back then, I weren't really going to gigs. It was it was the, the, the time of the DJ, which is... They were the, one of the things that took it back from the DJs a bit, weren't they? Right. And bear in mind as well, I, I'm that weird age where... Through life, there's this natural progression, isn't it? So you're young, dumb, full of cum. You get a car. All you think about is girls, you know, and then you probably get into your drinking and your drugs, so you ditch the car a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, and then, and then you know, maybe whatever, you, you get your own gaff up, whatever, whatever. So I'm probably slightly older than the generation who were really the, the Mondays hardcore fans if you know what I mean so by the time the live gigs were sort of becoming a thing again the road I was at Spike Island oh right I was I there. Had to be in bloody winters it's my hometown <laughs> you couldn't not go that could you um but but yeah really we were, I wasn't into the band thing then I was oh. the, the DJ was king and it was those bands that were sort of taking that back a little bit I suppose, again, that's part, part, I suppose, interesting about that movement. That's what was happening a little bit. It, it, it was becoming a real band thing again, as yeah. opposed to the, just the DJ. Yeah, yeah. Did you go and see them when when they'd been rehearsing with you? Well, you, they, you're sort of mates by then, and obviously, you know, they were here for at least three months. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you're working with them day in, day out, and then, of course, Annie's cleaning or milling around or whatever so they get to know you and yeah. and like I say instantly I know Paul's wife yeah. so you know what I mean it's sort of become you become very friendly so then you go oh we've, we've got a gig here you, you're coming down because it's local so yeah of course we went to a bunch of gigs but again for me working in this industry I'd much rather just go and hang backstage and have a giggle and a laugh and then go right Go and play your gig, and we'll wait here. And when you come back, we'll hang yeah. out. If you know what I mean. We yeah. always, we always ended up stood at the bloody side of the stage watching, yeah. rather than in the front of the stage. Because it's your mates, isn't it? You know what yeah. I mean. It's not. You're not like there to see a band. You, you're just hanging yeah. out with your pals, yeah. who just happen to be going on stage. Was it what you expected when you went to the live show? Did, was yeah. it? what you'd expected from what you'd seen in the rehearsal rooms. 
yes, like I say, the thing that surprised me the most with them is that they were a real band. Yeah. That is definitely the thing that surprised me most because, like I say, when, when you're listening to them in a club off your face and it's, you know, Paul Oak and Paul Daddy's hands on it and it's got a 909 kick underneath it, it it's, it's not a real band anymore. I know in the cold light of day when I listen to it now, I go, oh, there's Mark playing, there's Paul playing, you know, yeah. I can hear Gaz, you, whatever. I now know what it is, but at the time, you're not analysing it any deeper than I'm off my face and this feels great. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But again, not that you could ever call them a boy band, but for all intents and purposes, they could have been a boy band fronting Paul Oakenfold's dance music, for all I know. Do you know what I mean? But then when they get in a room and you hear them play together, you're like, holy shit, these, these are a real band who can actually play. And that was the thing that surprised me the most. So then when you go and watch them as a more mature gentleman, not off his face on drugs... You're going like, Jesus, these are really good. As a band, not just the music, but as a, as a functioning unit. You know what I mean? Did you get a sense that they were very nervous when they reformed and weren't sure whether they were going to be able to pull it off? Yeah, I think a lot of people were rusty. And again, from, from their perspective, you see, bear in mind, like I said, I spent a lot of time with them, particularly Gaz and Paul. Um, so you sort of become friends so you get to know a bit of the backstory and you know how they feel about stuff that they might not say to someone who's not a friend or something like that so yeah the, there was a lot of politics wasn't there so they're reforming first of all it was like one can we all be in a room together before playing a bloody note yeah. do you know what i mean so there's there's that there's there's the rust factor there's yeah. the the trepidation i suppose of we could put a lot of energy into this and it starts working and then it goes horribly wrong again very quickly because of the right. personnel. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So there was, I think all of that was at play. If you know what I mean. Particularly with, I think Gaz was like typical drummer, but I'll just sit at the back here and play and Gaz doesn't give a fuck, does he? So <laughs> if, if it all went tits up, Gaz would be like, fuck it. I'm gone. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I think, I suspect Paul was probably a bit more nervous about it. Yeah. And again, Paul... I, I suspect probably quite a sensitive individual underneath. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I think, and also there's the brotherly thing. So any issues would have hurt him and uh, more. Was Sean around for those rehearsals or was it just the musicians? Musicians. He, I think Sean turned up twice. Right. I mean, to be fair, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing that, that them lads who haven't played together for I don't know how many years got in a room and played, you probably, yeah. it was probably beneficial to them to not have a singer there. Because and, and, right. again, if you've got the singer there, you've got the pressure of shit, we need to get this because he can't do anything until we've right. got locked in. Yeah, so sure. in, in a weird way, it was probably a good thing. Yeah. But I suspect towards the end, he, he probably should have been here a bit more than he was. Right. Remember the times when he came in and what it was like? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Different. Immediately different. Um, it's weird. It's even though the Mondays are a real band in every sense, right? So so when I was at school and in bands, you formed bands with your mates, you know, and, you know, I, I, I'll be the drummer, I'll be the guitarist, I'll be the bass player, and you, you got in a rehearsal room and you made noise. And poor Dave was shit on bass. So you go, oh, Dave, you're a bit shit on bass, mate. We're looking out for a better bass player. But it, you still picked a bass player within your sort your circle of friends, yeah. so it was a real band in that sense. The Mondays were that; it was a real band of mates that went one day, let's form a band and muddled through and became what they became. And you definitely got that that sense of, of brotherhood, camaraderie within the band. But mm. when Sean arrived, it's it's Sean and the band. It's not. He's not a part of the band in that sense. Or it, it didn't feel like that to me anyway. It felt like it was Sean and the band. Right. Um, and the atmosphere changed. It suddenly was not as fun, for, for want of a better term. That's no disrespect to Sean. I, I suppose there was a lot of tensions there and everything. So everyone was suddenly like, oh, game face is on here. We're not here to enjoy ourselves anymore, which you should be. Yeah. You know, that's sort of the point. Mm. Yeah, 
Um, and and again, he wasn't here a lot. To be fair, the lads not 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 that he necessarily needed to be here a lot. The lads needed to to sort of gel and lock in together as a band. So he only made an appearance occasionally just to just to run through with them. But I suspect he towards the end of the rehearsals when they were getting ready to go on the road, he probably should have spent more time here just to try and build that cohesive unit. Yeah. But I, I, again, I, I don't think he's that bothered about that. You know what I mean? It's just a vehicle rather than right. this is us against the world, which is what a band yeah. should be. It's a shame, isn't it? It makes you wonder how much further they could have gone if it had been more of a cohesive unit. Do you know what? Yeah, they probably could have gone a lot further because, mm. again, you evolve. It, they, they're all really good musicians. They all, they can all play. You see this so many times. You, you get a band or whatever. It can be everything. It can be down from the management down to the label to the band. You, every is part of a team everything is a cog in the machine right yeah. and if it's working it's literally because of everything involved in that the moment you start dismantling it yeah poof the why magic's you, gone why won't we do an album with the proper musicians there's, there's something weird maybe maybe something will come out in years to come or maybe we'll never know there was some weird tension don't know were you around when Paul found out that Chico had got cancer? Were you, were you around? Yeah, it was. They, they were here. They oh, were here at the time. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, before you got the diagnosis of cancer, there was a there was a lump, wasn't there? And I think Paul was telling us that oh, you know, he was a bit concerned. They found this lump. We're going to go and have some tests, or you know, whatever he did at the time. And it was like, oh right, okay, mate. Well, you know, fingers crossed. Blah blah blah. And then the next thing is like, oh, it's cancer, you know, and it's like, oh, now now we're waiting to find out what the prognosis is. But and then and then it seems to accelerate what happened after that. You know, it was like shit. He's getting rushed in, fucking surgery, you know, and then the chemo and all that. Lot, lot. So yeah, I mean, it was uh, he was certainly <laughs> devastated by it, you know, and concerned, and wanted to get the fuck out of here. But and again. In one way, I suppose that's a testament to Paul. Personally, I think I'd have just gone, fuck this, I'm gone. Yeah. He was trying to do the right thing by both camps, I think. You know, he was like, I, I've got to go. I mean, I think if it comes to it, it was like, I'm going. But I think it was like, I don't want to stitch you lot up in the meantime. So, listen, I've got to go to the States, you know, but but, but how, how can we make this work? Do you remember the all the girls sending... Chico would get well card. Chico's within months of my daughter's age. Right. And again, as a parent, you, you know, watching what you lot were going through at the time with a child within months of the age of my daughter, you know, you're looking at your own kid going, fucking hell. Like, Jesus Christ, how the fuck are you two doing that? Like, do you know what I mean? It's, it's the worst, isn't it? It is the worst, isn't it? Well, you don't have a choice. You just have to do it. Well, like, I know that. It's no. like, you know, it's like when someone dies, you don't have a choice. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you've got to, you know, keep pushing through. But you, on the other foot, outside looking in, I'm going, oh, God, you know, Jesus Christ. That's, I mean, where your kids are involved, that's the worst, isn't it? That's, I know you don't have a choice, but that is about as bad as it gets. Yeah. But you kept in Ch in touch with Chico on Facebook, didn't you? You used to send him messages every so often and Yeah, well again, it's like when when someone's that ill or someone dies or you know <clears throat> what do you say? It's everything seems dead trite, doesn't it? You know, like, oh I'm sorry to hear so and so's died, or I'm sorry to hear your kids ill. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It always feels dead trite and I I don't like reaching out. Again, I'm, I'm one of these people who it always feels like, I'm a reaching out for me to make myself feel better when I'm looking at my daughter. And you just think, what can you say or do for that kid? I just thought, again and again, a child, I suspect, processes all this different than us, than an adult. They They probably don't have as much fear as an adult. Um, 
and the, the, the whole psychology and the way of processing probably is different. So I just went, listen, we're coming back to America next year. Like, how do you fancy going around on the bike? What am I going to fucking say? Do you know what I mean? Like, so all as I'm thinking is, it, it, there's a distant goal there. He can go, oh, that, you know what I mean? It's, a, I suppose, a distraction technique, isn't it? Or something like that. So that's how that came about. It was like, what do you say to a kid who's fucking got some horrific thing going on? Talk to me about when you came to America. When we come over to do the thing with Chico. I mean, we were, you know, we were travelling around anyway, you know, so we were going to pass through L.A., so it's like, it'd be rude not to... You know what I mean? you got a fucking mate who lives in L.A. If you're passing, you've got to come in, haven't you? you got to come and say hello. Yeah. But again, again Annie, we pulled up and she's like, oh, there's a film crew here and oh, no. She, she's not into that at all. But I'll tell you a funny one. So, um, you know, we, 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 we get on the bike and we kick Chico up and we ride off into the sunset and then the glamour of television, we then have to park up round the corner for 20 minutes while the camera crew drop everything and reload it into the... So me and Chico were sat on Cold Canyon Road. We sat on the bike, like, and I'm saying, uh, you know, how's it going? He's like, yeah, yeah, all right, blah, blah, blah. I said, are you getting back to Manchester much? Because obviously they've pretty much grown up in America now, haven't they? He said, yeah, we go, you know, once, maybe twice a year, go and see Nan and Grandad and all that lot. And then... Jokingly, I went, oh, do you miss it? <laughs> you know, thinking he was going to go, no. <laughs> and he went, oh, yeah, a little bit. And I went, really? What do you miss the most? And he went, the cold. <laughs> and the rain. Do you know what I mean? Like, he missed the cold and the rain. Because it's just sunny all the time. Feel about being filmed, be, uh, being on We the People. Have, have a lot of people re like recognised you from it? Uh, a few. I suspect if it, I was in America, I would probably get a lot of attention. A few people like would ring me up or, or message me, saying, you know, here. Oh, I said, oh did, I, did I tell you about when I showed it to my mum? Oh, Angela. So, my mother is. Old school, you know, she was born in the late 30s, grew up during the war, etc., etc., you know, probably was, she's a bit reformed now, but, you know, staunch Daily Mail reader, yeah. voted, voted Tory, you know, king and queen and all that lot. My mum was one of them. And I think I broached the... Never took a drug in her life. Right. Unless it was prescribed by a doctor. Yeah. Right. And I think as a result of filming weed the people i was maybe having a conversation with her about cannabis you know and I, in, again in in my mother's head if you smoke a joint you're a you're a crack addict do you know yeah. what i mean it's like that's she she knows nothing of that world so i must have been uh, there, there must have been this recurring theme of we were we were talking about cannabis and i'm going no it's it's really good for your mum you know I'll, there's this documentary on netflix blah 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 Anyway, I eventually convinced her to sit and watch this thing. Now, I didn't tell her I was in it. Uh, so we're watching with the people. And it comes to the point where I'm on, I, I'm either on the motorbike or next to the motorbike, kitting Chico up. Uh, you know, and I, I can't remember what I said, you know, like, oh, let's get this leather jacket on you. And my mum went, Jesus, you can tell he's not American, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and then I must, you know, put him on the bike or whatever. And then she, and then she stood up and she went, "Is that you?" <laughs> and I'm killing myself laughing. I'm killing myself laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so I to watch it. She was kill. Oh, I was killing myself. Excellent. You can tell he's not American. Um, it's your son. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can, can you remember when you found out that Paul had died? What what you were doing? Gaz had been in here the day before. We were working. With, I was working with Gaz at the time on his album. I think Mike 
rung me or messaged me. I think Gaz must have rung Mike right. to say I'm not going to be in today. Yeah. And then Mike, I was sat in here. I was probably sat right there. Yeah. I might have even been waiting for Gaz to, or, you know, sort of prepping for Gaz to come. You know, start to just come out of nowhere, didn't it? Yeah. Wasn't ill or, you know what I mean? That was yeah. like, yeah. that's the same age as me. Yeah. Yeah. I literally come out of nowhere. Yeah, I was here. What I was fucking you stunned. Yeah. I was just fucking shocked. So, they weren't rehearsing here, they were rehearsing in Manchester. And Gaz said he felt bad at rehearsals. He said he just... You know, like when you got flu or something, you just feel lethargic and you're just sat in a pity pool feeling sorry for yourself. He said he wasn't, he, he said he didn't play a note, which is unusual. Do you know what I mean? For him to not do anything. And he'd gone home, he'd had his tea, I think his mum had checked on him and said, you know, she felt something went right. He hadn't had his medicine or something like that. She heard him snoring at like 11 o'clock at night. So he was alive at 11 o'clock at night, and then Mark was there at, what, n nine, something like that, the following day. Uh, Amelia had found him. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And then they're fucking doing CPR on him. They're fucking shocked, Angela, because it come out of nowhere. It wasn't like he was ill. No. He was literally, he was fine. He hopped on a plane, got here, felt a bit ill, dead. Like, where the fuck did that come from? That was just bizarre. And we all know um, our feelings on it, the vaccine. Yeah. That's yeah. me and Gaz were talking about it. Yeah. Because I, I, we didn't like that idea to start with. No. And he went, he was fine. He had that. The yeah. boosters come here. Yeah. I know. And gone. Yeah. It, in a weird way, it surprises me because, again, Paul's like me. You know, we were punks. We grew up as punks. We're anarchists. We're... You know, and he's not an idiot, Paul. He wasn't an idiot. He wouldn't have just gone, you know, I'm not doing any research on this or having an opinion. I'll just do what I'm told. He's not that type of person. No. I think maybe he thought he had to have it to get into England or something. I suspect he did. Something like that, yeah. What did you make of the funeral? A fucking hour away to sung that song, I do not know. I know. That was know. hats off. Hats no. off to her. Yeah. It was it yeah. was a, quite an emotionally charged day. Yeah. And for her to be able to get up and sing yeah. one was was like hats off to you. Yeah. But uh yeah, that, that was beautiful. But yeah, no, it was it was good. Um, you know, all, all the usual suspects were there, weren't they? Yeah. But yeah, don't know how Ro did that. No, no. That was impressive. Yeah, and I felt I felt sorry. Chico looked lost. I felt Amelia was the one I felt the most sorry for. Jesus, she, that was just horrific. Particularly when we went to the creme. That was I. I. That's where I welled up at the creme. Really? Um, yeah. I was fine throughout it all. You know, like I say, I. I have a. A view. I'm going to a funeral to, to celebration of someone's life as opposed to, you know, mourning their loss. If you know what I mean. In my head. Um, and and in 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 that respect, that funeral was a success. It was a celebration of Paul's life. Well, he said the reason I'm doing this is so that when I'm gone, everyone's gonna like know who I was and know the truth. Yeah, yeah. But you know, Gaz was telling me something like that, and I was like, yeah. "Wow!" Because you, you you only finished it not long 12, before he died. Twelve days before he died. That's him? what I'm saying. It's just bizarre the way things but are lined also, up. even more bizarre is that both of us, like he was going to England for a few gigs and both of us felt this real sense of urgency to get it finished before he went to England. Right. And, when, and when when I got the call, it, I, it was six o'clock in the morning, I got up for a wee in the night and all these messages, so I knew something was up. Yeah, yeah, you do. When you get a call at that time in the morning. Yeah. And I just said, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew it, I knew it. Like, I didn't know I knew it, but... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had, and I think he knew, too. It's weird, really weird. Yeah, it's, it, this what I mean, it is all odd, mate. It's really yeah, odd. I know, I know. I mean, I know he wasn't, like, the picture of health. No, he did. I, don't, I suspect yeah. he's never seen the inside of a gym in his life. No. That man loved a nap. Yeah. How he could nap drinking that much Red Bull.
I don't know. But do you know what I mean? He, oh. he was lazy, but not in a bad way. No. Just he was relaxed. <laughs> I'd like to think of him as a sloth. Only doing what was necessary. Do you know what I mean? Not lazy, just only doing what was necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that type of personality. Why walk when someone could carry you somewhere? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why walk when I could catch a train or a taxi or something? Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. was sort of his philosophy. Yeah. It was. It genuinely was. <laughs> a laid-back individual you'll never meet. Yeah. Like, even now, I'm working with Gaz. It's like working with my brother. We're yeah. so dialed in yeah. just to each other's humour and references. You know, like... like like Paul, you know that subtle humour that might slip past someone. I walked in one day, <laughs> and they had um, this this Mac on, and it's sort of like a camouflage sort of pattern. Not overly camouflage, but you know when you get close, you look at it. It's like, oh, that's nice. It's cool. Yeah. And I walked in one day, and, and Gaz went, "Oh, I like that coat. Where'd you find it?" Yeah, see, you didn't get that. Oh, because it's camouflage. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, and I just pissed myself laughing. <laughs> now that's what I'm saying, it's that subtle. You didn't even get that. He did, he laughed. <laughs> you didn't get that, but it, it, I just burst out laughing when he said yeah. it. That subtle, dry humour, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and Paul was one of them. You know, just make some little comment. He was Mr. Laid Back. Mm. He was, he was one of the most laid back in a cool way people I've ever met. He was just, and again, like I said, I think him and my dad really hit it off. I think they were very similar natures. My dad was very comfortable in his own skin. Yeah. I mean, he just, he didn't want anything, didn't need anything, didn't value things. You know, he was, I, I found Paul a lot like that. Yeah. A lot like he was just a very content, yeah. You know, just just cruising along in his own lane, doing his thing. Don't bother me, I won't bother you. He was very much one of those people. In his company, you were all it was always fun and chill, yeah. not boring. Do you know what I mean? Boring's the wrong word. I'm using the wrong yeah, word. Boring. Yeah. yeah, it it wasn't like it wasn't like let's, Whereas if you were knocking around with Bess, it'd be a different fucking story, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that that would just be like non stop. Yeah. Paul was like the polar opposite. Possibly why the band worked. <laughs> you know Did, what I mean? Was Bez around the, the rooms much? No. No, no. A lovely fella, but he's a bloody nightmare, isn't he? But he's Bez, so yeah. it's it works. Yeah. It, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, and don't get me wrong, there's no harm in him. He's like a fucking Duracell bunny. I'm fatigued watching you. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, he's a great lad, lovely lad. Look, now he is a sweetheart. He is a sweetheart. Mark's nice as well, but he's different altogether, isn't he? Mark's a dad. Yeah. Mark is a dad, I, but was a dad from the day that band started. Yeah. Like literally and metaphorically. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just sort of Mr. Sensible. I mean, fucking hell, he's a school teacher. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He had kids when the band started. He's Captain Sensible, isn't he? He is Mr. Sensible, Mark. Again, mm. lovely fella. I get. I wouldn't. I haven't got a bad word to say about any of them. I got on really well with all. They're all really nice people. They're just different personalities. Like I say, Mark is Mr. Sensible, Mr. Just Dad. Yeah. Like you know, we, we you can see Mark in slippers, cardigan, pipe, fireplace. That's that that would be Mark's environment, if you know what I mean. And then you got Ro, who's the diva. Yeah. But and, and everything that, that that entails, which in my experience, you sort of need that in your singers. Yeah. That, that, that there is that element that makes us a, a person a singer, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So so Ro's what Ro is. And again, I've worked with Ro tons of times, so so we get on okay. And then like PD. Again, he was he was a really nice lad, PD. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He, he's really a sweetheart. I'd say he probably lacks confidence, but again, he was a sweetheart, lovely, lovely lad. Best, Best is, is a sweetheart. sweetheart. Mad as a box, box of frogs. frogs. But yeah. me, Gaz, and Paul, 
cut from the same cloth. So we we just it, it, it off like brilliant. Oh, thank you so much. No Nick. worries. You've been really good. I hope, I hope you can use some of it. Well, like I say, when you said, oh, I want to send someone else to talk to you, I'm, I'm thinking, I ain't got no, like, you know, fucking great insight here or, <laughs> you know, like some mad story. Oh, we, there was me, Paul, and 12 hookers. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure what value there is in this, but yeah, sure, go for it. Honestly, you've been brilliant. No problem. Thank you. That's it for this week. In a moment, you're going to be hearing the track that Latch was talking about earlier, which is The Ballad of David Bowie by Gaz Whelan's uh, side project, Yogi G and the Family Tree, which features none other than Paul Ryder on bass and Gaz Whelan on vocals. Please become a patron of the show and help us to keep these episodes coming. We really can't do this without you. Next week, we're going to have a shout out to all of our lovely patrons. Literally, everybody that supports the show is going to have their name read out in the show next week. So, if you'd like your name reading out, please go to patreon.com forward slash the Paul Rider Tapes and sign up. Also, go to paulrider.tv for links to our shop and our socials. Thank you so much for being here and listening. We really could not carry on if it wasn't for you listening, so we're really, really grateful. Please keep spreading the word about the podcast. We're actually approaching 100,000 downloads, so it's really amazing. We're really grateful. Thank you for telling all your friends about it, and please continue to do so. Please give us a nice review if you've not already done so and a rating. That really, really helps us. Big, big love and thanks, of course, go to Latch. And of course, the man himself, the late, great Paul Anthony Ryder. Have a fantastic week and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Lots of love. Bye. Yeah.